so we were discussing how will we confirm our diagnosis of gestation trophoblastic disease and the diagnosis can be confirmed on the ultrasound and ultrasound will show bilateral cystic masses and snowstorm appearance of the uterus so bilateral cystic masses are basically due to high level of beta hcg uh, which stimulates the thick internal cells to form a cyst like masses so in the ovaries uh, there will be cystic masses bilaterally on ultrasound and in the uterus there will be snowstorm appearance due to excessive proliferation of the trophoblastic cells grape like vesicles are formed which give a snowstorm appearance of uterus on ultrasound let me show you the diagram you can see uh, uh, this is an image of an ultrasound of the uterus these grape like vesicles black in color this is known as snowstorm appearance of or bunch of grape appearance of the ultrasound Presentation of gestational trophoblastic disease will be uh, remember three points: painless vaginal bleeding, hyperemesis, and large podate uterus. And investigation will show a high beta hCG, and ultrasound will show snowstorm appearance of the uterus and bilateral cystic masses in the ovaries. What is the management of gestational trophoblastic disease management is very simple uh, dilatation and pre-charge and post suction pre-charge and then after suction and pre-charge we need to do two weekly beta hcg levels till it become normal and if a patient is diagnosed with choriocarcinoma or high beta hcg even after uterine evacuation then she will need chemotherapy so in the management of gestational trophoblastic disease is palliation and pre-charge and then two weekly measurement of beta hcg level urine beta hcg level till it becomes normal and chemotherapy is advised in case of choriocarcinoma or high beta hcg even after uterine evacuation remember that after diagnosis of a moral pregnancy a woman is advised to not to conceive again or to use a barrier method <clears throat> For at least six months, and if she is on chemotherapy uh, due to invasive choriocarcinoma, then she advise she is advised to use barrier contraception or to avoid pregnancy at twelve months after completing the treatment. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, she would be at high risk of premature ovarian failure, right? If it was choriocarcinoma and she had to receive chemotherapy? Yes, chemotherapy and radiotherapy can cause premature ovarian failure. So yes, she can develop premature ovarian failure. But she's uh, advised not to get pregnant again because pregnancy can also cause uh, high beta HCG level. And if she become pregnant, then it will be difficult to monitor uh, the disease. Then we, we would not know if the high beta HCG level uh, is due to 
uh, disease reoccurrence or is it due to pregnancy so that's why if a woman is diagnosed with molar pregnancy then she is why to not get pregnant six months after her beta hcg level become normal and if in chemotherapy then 12 months after completing her treatment the chemotherapy that is used in the molar pregnancy is methotrexate so this was all about gestational trophoblastic disease gestational trophoblastic disease is due to abnormality in the number of chromosomes or due to abnormal fertilization of sperm and an ovum which leads to excessive proliferation of the trophoblastic cell and there are four types of gestational trophoblastic disease complete so somehow someone has any question so complete hereditary form mole partial hereditary form mole and invasive mole and chorioplastoma two are benign form of gestational trophoblastic disease complete and partial hereditary form mole and two are malignant invasive mole and chorioplastoma and in the malignant cases chemotherapy is required along with the therapy a diagnosis is confirmed on ultrasound ultrasound will show bilateral cystic masses in the ovary and no sperm appearance no sperm appearance of mixed exogenicity in the uterus the sperm sperm appearance is due to excessive proliferation of trophoblastic cell management is surgical evacuation and then check beta hcg levels every 2 week no pregnancy is allowed until beta hcg is back to normal which is beta hcg level usually return to normal after 6 months so no pregnancy for 6 months and the woman is advised a barrier contraception and if it's choriocarcinoma or invasive mole then no pregnancy for 12 months after completion of the treatment presentation or the clinical features the important clinical features for general bleeding in the first trimester large for date uterus and hyperemesis and sometimes passage of vesicles to vagina can also be mentioned in the clinical scenario so this was all about molar pregnancy i hope it's clear to everyone Hello, uh, doctor. Uh, just one question regarding this: uh, 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 What would be the findings? Uh, uh, like, will will there be a different findings for benign and malignant on ultrasound, or both of them will show like a snowstorm appearance of mixed echogenicity? Uh, in region, uh, invasive carcinoma, invasive mole, and uh, invasive mole will show uh, invasion of the uterine wall. on ultrasound uh, but the finding will be the same such as no stroma appearance and fecal ulcer the diagnosis of choreo carcinoma or invasive mole is confirmed on the histopathology or biopsy report then uh, we do dilatation and curettage of a gestational trophoblastic disease then we send the sample for histopathology to rule out choreo carcinoma so it can only be confirmed on biopsy or histopathology okay that's fine thank you on ultrasound it is difficult to differentiate between other benign and malignant conditions okay thank you any more questions So next topic is stages of labor. 
there are three series of labor stage one stage two and stage three stage one is onset of labor or to full dilatation of service stage one is further divided into two phases latent phase and active phase latent phase is cervical dilatation from zero to three centimeters and active phase is cervical dilatation from 3 cm to 10 cm. This is called active phase because uh, there is an active uh, pushing by the mother in this phase. Stage 2 is the delivery of the fetus and stage 3 is the delivery of the placenta and number 8. What are the signs of a true labor? Regular and painful uterine contraction. It shows that is a shedding of the mucus plug, rupture of the membrane, and shortening and dilatation of the cervix. So a true labor is regular and painful contraction, regular and painful uterine contraction with cervical changes such as shortening and dilatation of the cervix. What is a false labor? If there are regular and painful uterine contraction without cervical changes, then we'll call it as false labor. Sometimes the labor is stuck at the first stage or at the latent phase of the labor. When uh, the cervix is three centimeter dilated, but there is no further dilatation, then we say that the labor is stuck in the first phase, first stage. So what uh, we can do, we can perform amniotomy. If the waters have not been broken yet, followed by uh, to give uh, an IV drip of oxytocin, uh, which is come by the injection name syntocin. So if the labor is stuck at the first stage, in the latent phase of the first stage, then we can do amniotomy along with IV oxytocin. Amniotomy will be done if the waters have not been broken yet. And if the water has been broken yet and uh, labor is still stuck, then we will only use IV drip of oxytocin. Sometimes uh, due to a large baby or due to the baby anterior shoulder becomes stuck in the pelvis of the mother. What will happen if this is the case? On every retraction, uh, the fetal head will emerge and then it will retract immediately, just like uh, the head of a turtle. So this is called turtle sign. The turtle sign is a sign for shoulder dystocia. Uh, during labor, if with every retraction the fetal head emerges and then retracts immediately, then we will suspect shoulder dystocia. And the first thing uh, you do uh, that you do if you are suspecting shoulder dystocia, you call for help. The first step is to call for help and uh, you do rotational maneuvers and then if uh, doing episiotomy can be helpful in doing the rotation or in doing the maneuvers, then episiotomy can also be done. This is uh, the stepwise management of shoulder dystocia. If turtle signs is present during labor, then the first thing is do you do is call for help. The second step is McRoberts maneuver. And the third step is suprapubic pressure. What we do in McRoberts maneuver, in McRoberts maneuver we do flexion. Flexion and adduction of the thighs or in simple words, thighs to abdomen. 
then we'll apply suprapubic pressure. And if still the baby is not delivered, then we can consider episiotomy if it will make the internal maneuver easier. So if turtle sign is present, then it is shoulder dystocia. And we have discussed the stepwise management of shoulder dystocia. After calling for help, McRoberts maneuver, that is flexion and abduction of the maternal hips, bringing the mother thighs towards her abdomen. So thighs towards abdomen, and then applying suprapubic pressure. And after this, uh, we can consider an episiotomy. Episiotomy will not relieve the bony obstruction, but it will sometimes uh, use to allow better access for internal maneuvers. Remember that oxytocin administration is contraindicated in shoulder dystocia. What are the risk factors for shoulder dystocia? Large size babies or fetal macrosomia such as if the baby's weight is more than 4.5 kg, which can be due to maternal diabetes mellitus. So maternal diabetes mellitus and fetal macrosomia are risk factors for shoulder dystocia. Maternal BMI more than 30 is also risk factor for shoulder dystocia, previous history of shoulder dystocia and prolonged labor. All of them can be to shoulder dystocia. Our next topic is postpartum hemorrhage. Postpartum hemorrhage is defined as 500 ml, more than 500 ml blood loss from the genital tract within the first 24 hours of birth. So there are two types of postpartum hemorrhage. One is primary postpartum hemorrhage and one is secondary postpartum hemorrhage. So if more than 500 ml of blood is lost from the general tract within the first 24 hours, then we will call it as primary postpartum hemorrhage. And if more than 500 ml of blood is lost after 24 hours up to 12 weeks postpartum, then we'll call it as secondary postpartum hemorrhage. So if there is a hemorrhage within the first 24 hours, then it is primary. After 24 hours up to 12 weeks, then it is secondary. What were the causes of primary postpartum hemorrhage? Remember that two important causes for primary postpartum hemorrhage is uterine atony and laceration of uterus, cervix, or vagina. Any injury to the uterus, cervix, or vagina during the process of delivery can lead to primary postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, the more important cause is, or the common cause is uterine atony. So remember these two important causes of primary postpartum hemorrhage. Secondary postpartum hemorrhage, or secondary postpartum hemorrhage, also remember two important causes, and that is uh, retained placenta or clots and endometriotitis, infection of the endometrium. So two causes for primary postpartum hemorrhage and two causes for secondary postpartum hemorrhage. Another cause, remember four T's, prone, uterine atony, uh, tissues, retained tissues, trauma to the uterus, cervix or vagina and coagulopathy, which can lead to disseminated intravascular coagulation can also lead to postpartum hemorrhage. So can somebody tell me a condition in pregnancy uh, that is associated with uh, DIC or disseminated intravascular coagulation? Which condition um, is that? Yeah. Death of a fetus? 
placenta previa maybe uh placenta previa yes placenta uh, what is more common condition that can lead to death of the fetus abruption yes placental abruption can lead to intrauterine death of the baby and it can the patient can develop dic so patient with a history of placental abruption if he she present to you with postpartum bleeding then you will suspect a dic disseminated intravascular coagulation how will you confirm the diagnosis of disseminated intravascular coagulation what is the lab abnormalities that are present in the disseminated intravascular coagulation can somebody tell me those so everything approved from the time pgt app everything will be raised Except what? Low hemoglobin, lesser weight, platelet count lesser fifty thousand. So platelets. And PPOPT more than one point five in the blood. So only raise APTT and uh, all other things will be low. Low fibrinogen, low PPOPT platelets. PPOPT more than one point five. Yes, PPOPT raised. And platelets, fibrinogen, and they will be low. So we are discussing a primary postpartum hemorrhage that is a loss of five, more than five hundred ml of blood in the first twenty four hours of uh, delivering the baby after delivering the baby. is a primary postpartum hemorrhage and the most common cause of primary postpartum hemorrhage is uterine atonia and the management is very simple uh, this is a step wise management of uh, primary postpartum hemorrhage uh, due to uterine atonia so in the pleb one exam this question we will be asked like this that a patient has developed a postpartum hemorrhage after delivering the baby and his uterus is still palpable above the umbilical if the uterus is still palpable above the umbilicus then uh, the diagnosis of uterine atonia will be made then the cause for this postpartum hemorrhage will be uterine atonia so how uh, we are going to manage uterine atonia the management is very simple The first step is do uh, that we will do a bimanual compression of the uterus. Bimanual compression of the uterus, and the first line pharmacological treatment for uterine atonia is oxytocin IV infusion. And if there is no improvement with oxytocin, leads to uh, uterine muscle contraction, and it can treat uterine atonia and control the postpartum hemorrhage. similarly if there is a still hemorrhage or bleeding going on even after oxytocin iv infusion then the second line drug is ergo ergometrin ergometrin directly stimulates the uterine smooth muscles and it lead to the uterine contraction as well and the third line drug is carboprost so oxytocin ergometrin and the third drug is carboprost carboprost is basically a synthetic prostaglandins it can they can also stimulate the uterine contraction so they can also be used if there is no response with oxytocin ergometrin then carboprost can also be used but if after these uh, pharmacological intervention there is still bleeding going on then we can use balon tamponade B linked sutures or bilateral ligation of the uterine arteries, and if even after even after all these measures, they're still bleeding, then we will do hysterectomy, the last option. So three drugs in the pharmacological management of PPH or uterine atonia: oxytocin, IV, ergometrine, IV or IEM, carboprost, IEM, and then. three surgical procedures 
balloon tamponade a balloon is uh, inflated in the uterus that put pressures on, pressure on the bleeding points and stop the bleeding beta lich sutures what are beta lich sutures and beta lich sutures what we do we expose the interior and posterior uh, uterine walls like this opposing the anterior and posterior uterine walls so sutures will uh, decrease the blood flow to the uterus and control the bleeding uterine artery ligations can also be done and in the end the last option that we have is hysterectomy so this was step wise management of pph due to uterine atony which is the most common cause of primary pph the other common cause of primary pph is trauma trauma such as to the uterus cervix or vagina it can also uh, cause a primary pph now the trauma the risk factor for trauma during pregnancy uh, they include if uh, there is macrosomia or the baby's weight is high or for sub delivery they can lead to trauma to the uterus cervix or vagina and they can also cause primary pph so in the plaf one exam if a woman present to you with primary pph and her uterus is still palpable above them like us then the cause will be uterine atony and if uh, the uterus is not palpable and she has a history of uh, diabetes mellitus or the baby weight is higher than 4.5 kg then the cause will be trauma to the uterus cervix or vagina and it will be treated as surgical suturing of the laceration and if the pph is due to a uh, retained products of the placenta and that uh, will only be confirmed on the ultrasound then the treatment for them is that uh, we'll have to remove these retained tissues and if the bleeding is due to dac then how we are going to manage a pph due to dac we will need to correct the clotting factors uh, by giving fresh frozen plasma so this is how different causes of uh, postpartum hemorrhage are managed so postpartum bleeding with uterus palpable uterus the cause will be atonic uterus postpartum bleeding uh, in a diabetic lady with impalpable uterus the cause will be cervical or vaginal trauma big baby in a diabetic mother is a risk factor for tear or trauma at delivery don't forget this point now secondary pph secondary pph is the most important cause of secondary pph is endometriosis and retained placental tissue can also cause secondary pph we have already discussed the management of retained placental tissue now we will discuss endometriosis so if the baby is delivered through a cesarean section then the chances of an infection of the endometrium are high so cesarean section is a an important risk factor for the development of endometriotitis and endometriotitis which is an infection of the endometrium because it's an infection of the endometrium so if a patient present to you with secondary pph or vaginal bleeding along with fever then you will suspect endometriotitis and the investigation the initial investigation that is initially done is high vaginal swabs 
So high vaginal swab is ordered if we are suspecting endometriotis. Can somebody tell me what are the other indication for high vaginal swab? Yes, trichomonas vaginalis, bacterial vaginosis, and general candidiasis. So in those three infections, as well as in if you are suspecting endometritis, we will order high vaginal swab. So the presentation of postpartum endometritis is uh, abnormal vaginal bleeding. Uh, that is the main feature because it is an important cause of postpartum hemorrhage. So it will present with abnormal vaginal bleeding. And along with the bleeding, uh, signs of infection will be present, such as fever, abdominal pain, offensive spelling, lochia, and dyspareunia and dysuria. The risk factors for endometriosis is include cesarean section. This is the highest risk factor because during cesarean section, the chances of contamination of the endometrium are high. Prolonged rupture of membrane. So prolonged rupture of membrane can cause endometriosis. And premature rupture of the membrane can cause which infection? Can somebody tell me that? Which infection, oh, yeah. cause, which infection can be caused by the premature or preterm oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But, but yes, chorioaminitis. So, if a pregnant lady with a history of Preterm premature rupture of membrane present to you with the uh, signs of infection, then the diagnosis will most likely be chorioaminitis. And if a lady uh, in postpartum period with a history of cesarean section or prolonged rupture of membrane or retained product of contraception present to you with sign of infection, then the diagnosis will be endometritis. The treatment for or the management of endometritis is IV clindamycin and gentamicin. co or augmentin can also be used, but if there is allergy to the penicillin, then IV clindamycin and gentamicin, they can be used as well. So this was all about uh, the causes of primary postpartum hemorrhage and secondary postpartum hemorrhage. So who will repeat uh, the management of primary postpartum hemorrhage of due to uterine atony? What is the pharmacological treatment for primary postpartum hemorrhage due to uterine atony? Who will repeat this? First of all, we will uh, uh, do bimanual compression to yes. Yes. And in the pharmacological, there will be first of all oxytocin or IV in heal form. And then there will be option of agamethine if the hypertension is excluded, IV or IL. And then if it, is, it doesn't work, then we will go for a carboprost. And if the pharmacological therapy fails, then we will go for the uh, uh, bearings and then bilateral uh, 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 ligation of the uterine arteries and uh, then we go often for the hysterectomy. Uh, That's right, excellent. Now, our next topic is anemia in pregnancy. So, the hemoglobin levels uh, in pregnancy to label it as anemia. In the first trimester, a group hemoglobin level of less than 11 milligram per deciliter. In the second uh, trimester, less than 10.5. And in the third 
uh, and in the second and third trimester less than 10.5 gram per deciliter and in the postpartum period less than 10 level of hv will mention we label this patient as anemia the management of anemia in pregnancy is parasitocate also an important point for folic acid dose in pregnancy the usual dose of folic acid to prevent neural tube defect is 0. 4 milligram or 400 microgram day for 12 weeks of pregnancy 5 milligram a day for 12 weeks of pregnancy if any of the following is present that is diabetes mellitus and bmi is more than 30 a pregnant woman taking antiepileptics and family history of neural tube defect and previous pregnancy with neural tube defect so if any of these is present then we will give 5 milligram a day for 12 weeks and 5 milligram for the entire length of pregnancy if the patient has a sickle cell disease or thalassemia or thalassemia trait the three scenarios 400 microgram or 0 0.4 milligram for 12 weeks normally 5 milligram for 12 weeks if diabetes mellitus bmi more than 30 a female who is taking antiepileptics family history of neural tube defect and previous pregnancy with neural tube defect. and if any Neurotic disorders such as sickle cell disease, thalassemia, or thalassemia trait, then we need to give 5 milligram of folic acid for the entire length. Now, some points about routine testing in pregnancy blood group and ARC status is the also, if the mother is RH negative, then RH antibodies are also checked. Can somebody tell me why RH antibodies are checked in an RH negative mother? Because of sensitization in her, her next pregnancy. Next pregnancy. So if an RH negative mother has negative D antibodies or there are no D antibodies are present, then what will you do? Preventive dose at 28 to 34 weeks of NTD. Yes, an injection of NTD Immunoglobulins will be given at 28 and 34 weeks of gestation. That's why we need to check RH antibodies in female with RH negative blood group so that we can give NTD injection at 28 and 34 weeks of gestation. Because at 28 and 34 weeks of gestation, uh, there are maximum chances of minor hemorrhages that can lead to crossing of the fetal blood to the maternal blood. So that's why we check these 